Well, for five weeks, we've been exploring the Bible, looking at the plagues and pestilence that's in there. And now let's take some of those tools and see if we can take the mask off of the pandemic. <laughs> Welcome to Sunday School. I'm Father Timothy Matkin, your instructor. Glad you joined us for this exciting conclusion about the Bible and the pandemic. Before we go any further, if you would do us a favor and uh, look down below and bless that like button. It helps us out and subscribe to the channel. Share this with your friends on Facebook or Twitter uh, so other people can be exposed to this. They may be asking the same kinds of questions and interested in what the Bible has to say. Also, comment down below and uh, be regular in this time, especially this time of pandemic, be regular in prayer and fast once a week and do penance. Examine your conscience and look for things that you need to repent of and memento mori, be mindful of your own mortality. Before we get into our study, we want to have some opening prayers and I invite you to pray with me. The Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and several colics from the prayer books. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our first collect is from the 1662 prayer book for the prayer in any time of common plague or sickness. Let us pray. O Almighty God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and also in the time of King David did slay with the plague of pestilence threescore and ten thousand, and yet remembering thy mercy did save the rest, have pity upon us miserable sinners, who are now visited with great sickness and mortality, that like as thou didst then accept of an atonement, and didst command the destroying angel to cease from punishing, so it may now please thee to withdraw from us this plague and grievous sickness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. From the 1928 prayer book, In Time of Great Sickness and Mortality, let us pray. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their cure, and grant that perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And from the, 16, or the 2019 prayer book, uh, for the medical professions, let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people, continue, we beseech thee, this his gracious work among us, especially praying for Mike in the hospital. Cheer, heal, and sanctify the sick. Grant to the physicians, surgeons, and nurses wisdom and skill, sympathy and patience, and send down thy blessing upon all who labor to prevent suffering and to forward thy purposes of love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And finally, in mindfulness of our own mortality, a prayer from the burial office of the 1979 prayer book. Let us pray. O God, whose days are without end, and whose mercies cannot be numbered, make us, we beseech thee, deeply sensible of the shortness and uncertainty of life, and let thy Holy Spirit lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days, that when we shall have served thee in our generation, we may be gathered unto our fathers, having the testimony of a good conscience, in the communion of the Catholic Church, 
in the confidence of a certain faith, in the comfort of a reasonable religious and holy hope, in favor with thee, our God, and in perfect charity with the world, all which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, to summarize where we were last time in our study when we looked at the plague upon uh, King David's kingdom in Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 24 and in 1 Chronicles 21, remember King David had ordered a census to take account of how many fighting men are at his disposal, perhaps for planning future conquest. His general, Joab, recognized the impropriety of his request and tried to talk him out of it. But David insisted, and Joab complied. And when Joab returns with the numbers, David kind of, well, he comes to his senses about the census, and he regrets what he had ordered. The prophet Gad is sent to David to present a choice of three divine chastisements. The last option, a pestilence of three days, begins and works its way quickly through the country. And when the angel of death gets to Jerusalem, David offers himself in exchange for sparing his people. God accepts David's repentance, and the angel of death sheathes his sword over the spot, the very spot where David builds the altar of what will be the new temple for the Lord in Jerusalem. In the punishments from which David must choose, we see the principle that people will suffer for the sins of their leaders and that the innocent will suffer for the sins of the guilty. So just because someone is brought to great sickness or even death during a time of plague is no indication that that individual is guilty of any particular crime for which he or she is being punished. In fact, just the opposite. The suffering endured for the sins of others illustrates the injustice which brought about such judgment in the first place. And the judgment is typically when God simply allows natural processes to work themselves out without his guiding and protective hand. The story should equally remind us that God takes into account repentance, doing penance, and the sincere offering of sacrifices. He wants us to amend our ways, just as a parent wants a child to mature. And he wants us to, he wants to relent in the infliction of divine wrath, just like a parent doesn't want to punish his child. And it's no accident that the very altar of the temple marks the spot where the plague came to an end. So what would it mean for us to build an altar to the Lord, as it were, as David did, offering himself on behalf of his people, pleading for mercy for his people? Well, let's take what we've learned and use the tools of our insights from the Bible to take the mask off the pandemic. Well, this this is going to be a challenge, uh, a challenge of discernment, because we're about to engage in some speculation. Now, up until now, we've been going through the Bible, looking at the stories that it has to and seeing what it has to teach us, but here we're trying to put these puzzle pieces together. So we're going to engage in some discernment, really some speculation. But this is not a random speculation. This is an informed speculation. And we're going to take kind of a high altitude and big picture. There's a whole lot of things to bring together. In fact, uh, over the course of these weeks, I've thought of things, a whole long list of things that I'm not, I'm not even going to get around to bring it in to mention. But I, I tried to pick up maybe the biggest pieces, the most important pieces, and see how they might fit together. And all of these things really could be given their own video, but we don't want to do all that. We want to kind of take a high altitude view of this. So I've given you some homework with this. Uh, I put links in the description down below, and I encourage you to spend some time following up on some of those links if you're interested in further learning about those topics and further discernment about it. Now, one of the problems that we have right away, we need to acknowledge, is that we don't have any modern-day prophet. Now, we might have a message being sent 
through a, a, an event like the pandemic, but as far as interpreting, that's where the difficulty lies. We don't have any modern day prophet, though we have had many saints down through the years with gifts of prophecy, like most recently probably Padre Pio, but we don't have the prophet so-and-so. And that's, well, that's too bad. Because uh, in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, we read, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. And oh, how we could use a prophet. Now, there were prophets in the New Testament. A lot of people don't realize that. They think prophets, that's the Old Testament. But there were New Testament prophets. In fact, in Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, where we, it's a familiar passage, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, that is the church, built upon what? The foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, we usually think of that being like the Old Testament and the New Testament as the foundation, but no, the apostles and prophets are New Testament. For example, in Acts 15, 32, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, exhorted the brethren with many words and strengthened them. Acts 13, verse 1. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, it's not clear whether these are two categories here or one category with two names, prophets and teachers. But it does tell us there were prophets. And of course, in Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. And the disciples determined, every one according to his ability, to send relief to the brethren who lived in Judea. And so that gives us an example of how the ministry of God's prophet actually motivated practical action on behalf of the people to respond to what God was saying. Oh, if we only had a prophet. Well, we got puzzle pieces and we got we have principles and lessons from the Bible to help guide us in trying to figure out how to put things together. And if there's a message, surely we can at least discern the bare bones of it all. Another challenge we have to face is that God is slow to anger. We addressed the issue earlier in our study about, yes, God does get angry. Yes, he does punish his people. God punishes the wicked and he he corrects his children with chastisements, but he is also described as being slow to anger. So that can make it a little difficult to discern sometimes what he's angry about. In fact, this is one of your homework pieces. If you'll look down below, there's the Bible Project, which is a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And they have a video that's very good. It's called Slow to Anger, which kind of explains all of that and the the richness of the biblical tradition about describing God in that regard. Another thing we have to recognize and deal with is our perspective and, and the limit on our perspective and the limit on our experience and knowledge in terms of trying to discern and put all these things together. I have an American perspective. I have a Christian perspective. I have a Southern perspective. I'm it's my own viewpoint, and I don't necessarily see this thing from all angles. I see it from my angle, and that can be a limiting factor. And yet, on the other hand, we should realize that the American perspective is, is a huge one because America and China really dominate the affairs and the culture of the whole world. So those two nations might relate most closely to discerning the meaning of a global pandemic. Another thing we should consider is the time factor. What has changed? Um, when are these things happening? I'm, I'm also very intrigued. I don't know that there's any parallel example to this, but the name of the disease, at least at first, was COVID-19. 
19, a name 19 because it appeared in the year 2019. Now it's been renamed. Now it's called SARS-CoV-2. I don't know why that decision was made. Maybe it's sort of a standardization kind of thing that they decided to do, but it's interesting that this disease has the name, has the year on it in its name, because everybody still calls it coronavirus or COVID-19. So does that give us a clue about finding the answers when we think of when? When did things happen? What happened in 2019 or, or just before 2019, kind of going into that year? Or what old problems became manifested in 2019 or in 2020 when all of these things blew up because of the virus. So that could be um, a source of clues. So what I want to do is walk through some of the major events in a chronological fashion and see what clues might pop up. Now, we, begin, we can begin with um, a few things in 2018 because there's a, some things that are perhaps significant. Um, first, I would note the United States Embassy officially relocated to Jerusalem on May 14th, 2018 to coincide with the seven, 70th anniversary of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And we'll come back to that later. So that happened before 2019, 2018, mid-year. Also mid-year 2018 was known as the Summer of Shame among Catholics, exposing not only the predatory behavior of Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, also known as Uncle Ted, but also of the history of cover-up by bishops. And now, wind your clock back a little further. In 2002 and about 2000, the, the clergy abuse scandal hit the United States very hard. The U.S. bishops charged with both being spiritual fathers to their priests and with the duty to protect their flock, they rushed through what was called the Dallas Charter because the meeting basically was here in Dallas to protect minors and to put in place measures to discipline and remove priests and others who worked for the church who had been credibly accused of abuse. So they put in a whole system of safety protocols to deal with this. But notably, not noticed too much at the time, but definitely noticed now, the bishops themselves were not subject to the Charter's disciplinary measures. Well, the scandals ebbed and flowed in subsequent years, and the U.S. Catholic Church, according to many external auditors, became a model of safety protocol and practice. And yet, Uncle Ted McCarrick, who was, by the way, instrumental in that Dallas Charter meeting and keeping the bishops free from disciplinary accountability, he rose through the church in the early 2000s. And as they say, everyone knew, including many in the Catholic and secular press. And he got a free pass, really, because because of his homosexual character. He got a free pass on the abuse of minors and seminarians. Tacit acceptance of illicit relationships among the clergy, noticeably among those formed in those tumultuous years from the late 60s to the late 80s, allowed the abuse of power that seemed to have reached a peak with the revelations at the beginning of the century, but now has reemerged both with McCarrick and also these seminary abuses down in Chile and Honduras. And Pope Francis is intimately connected to these scandals, having personally rehabilitated McCarrick. Pope Benedict had put him on sort of a forced retirement, you know, go sit on the bench from now on, which is not sufficient, but it was something and Pope Francis rehabilitated him and put him to work again and showed him favor, especially in having him negotiate a deal between the Vatican and China to recognize that state-approved patriotic 
church in China, and threw the many martyrs and faithful of the underground Chinese church under the bus. Well, as you probably know, McCarrick was stripped of the dignity of cardinal and also defrocked from the clerical state. Now, it sounds like a proper treatment unless you realize that the move was made to avoid a public trial of a cleric under church law. So this is a sweeping under the rug. And the recently released McCarrick report is a scandal of misdirection and skirting responsibility. Check out some of the links down in the description below if you want to read more about that. Well, let's get on to the events of 2019. And these, I, found, I basically listed everything that was interesting to me. And some of these may figure in, some may not. We'll see how that goes. So January 5th, right before Epiphany, 2019, Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople grants to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine independence from the Orthodox Church of Russia. Now, in the West, you may think, big whoop, who cares? Well, this created a huge schism in Orthodoxy. Um, and who knows when it'll ever be patched up. And so, especially if you have an Eastern perspective, this could figure in enormously in terms of how you see these things unfold uh, and what meaning might, behind, might be behind the pandemic. Well, January 23rd, the Venezuelan presidential crisis begins with that election and who's really the president and so on. And I think that could perhaps relate somehow because maybe it relates to this question of Marxism. Is this the halting of the spread of communist-run countries? I don't know. Could be a moment. And, and that continues on um, for quite some time throughout the year. And then in February, the Document on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together also known as just the Abu Dhabi Declaration, is put out. It's signed. It's a joint statement signed by Pope Francis for the Catholic Church and by Sheikh Ahmed al Tayyib, Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, uh, in, on February 4th, 2019, and in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. It contains the assertion that, quote, the diversity of religions is willed by God. So in other words... Not just Christianity, but the whole spectrum. False religions willed by God. Now, Bishop Athanasius Snyder called for a public correction from Pope Francis and said, quote, There can be no doubt that St. Paul would say today concerning this controversial formulation in the Abu Dhabi statement, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you. Let him be anathema. That's from Galatians 1, 8 and 9. Well, the Pope responded that it was referring to the permissive will of God. This is something that God allowed. So not the active will of God, but the permissive will of God. However, the grammar of the statement just doesn't allow for that kind of interpretation. So it was a scandal and it was never really resolved. April 15th. During Holy Week, if you recall, a major fire engulfs Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, resulting in the roof and main spire coming crashing down. Cause, as far as I have heard, still unknown. And it is definitely a vivid, vivid sign and symbol of perhaps an inner reality that's going on. April 21st, very famously, if you recall, a series of bomb attacks occur at eight locations in Sri Lanka, including three churches, four hotels, and one housing complex in Colombo on Easter Sunday, leaving 259 people dead and over 500 injured. And then next, I, I put this on there because I found it intriguing, Avengers Endgame is released on April 26th in theaters breaking box office records, becoming the highest grossing movie of all time, at least so far. Now, I'm intrigued by a couple of things. Okay, it's named Endgame, and it's the end of at least that segment of the Marvel series. But looking back on it now, it could really signal the end of an industry. 
the end of movies as we know them. From now on, it really could be all just kind of next Netflix and HBO Max, and there may not be much of a cinema going forward. And also the story. The story is about the death of half the population, <laughs> as well as eugenics and a, a kind of a story that's a commentary on the, the micromanagement of a tyrannical um, authority and government. So I found that interesting. I'll put that on the list. May 8th, the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995 requires the U.S. ambassador to have a permanent residence in Jerusalem, which is a condition that was fulfilled on May 8th, 2019. Remember, 2018 was when they moved the embassy, but the law wasn't completely fulfilled until 2019. Connection? Who knows? May 12th, Pope Francis authorizes pilgrimage to Medjugorje, considering, quote, the considerable flow of people who go to Medjugorje and the abundant fruits of grace that have sprung from it. Now, why is that on the list? Well, these pilgrimages can now be officially organized by dioceses and parishes. It, it was not the case before. There were no officially church-authorized pilgrimages, even though a lot of people went. So now they're authorized. So that's the big change in May of 2019. So these pilgrimages can now be officially done even though the visions have not been authenticated at any level in the church. Pope Francis himself expressed grave doubt about their authenticity. There was a plane ride and an interview and he said, quote, these presumed apparitions don't have a lot of value. And the two bishops of Mostar, the local bishops, and the regional conference of bishops have all denounced them as false. And yet the church would condone and legitimize the following of these messages from heaven that it considers to be false, as not coming from heaven at all. And as sort of an exclamation point on it all, Tomislav Vaslavic, the former priest and spiritual director of the seers of Medjugorje, was excommunicated on July 15th in this year, 2020. He, he had gone off the rails a long time ago. May 17th of 2019, Taiwan's parliament becomes the first in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. Now, why did I put that on the list? Well, as far as I can tell, this seems to be the last continent on which same-sex marriage becomes legal. I think all the other continents, uh, it has been authorized before this point. And so Taiwan becomes the first in Asia. Now it's on all continents, basically in, in a symbolic way, all across the globe now. June 9th. This is when the Hong Kong protests begin, and that lasts all the way into this year, 2020. Over a million people in Hong Kong protest against the proposed legislation regarding extradition to mainland China. And it is the largest protest in Hong Kong since the 1997 handing over. Well, for those interested in climate issues, in July, uh, NOAA reports um, that, it, well, they reported in August that July 2019 was the hottest month on record globally at uh, 1.71 degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average. Uh, later, of course, in the year, Greta Thunberg was chosen as the time person of the year for her climate protest. Also, uh, in a March 22nd, 2020 interview with Spanish journalist uh, Jorde Evole, not sure how to say that, Pope Francis was asked whether the present pandemic is not, quote, a revenge of nature. Well, the Pope answered with a popular saying, which he repeats like a theological axiom, God forgives always. We men forgive sometimes. Nature never forgives. And he added that nature is kicking us so that we can take care of it. So we can throw that one into the mix. And then this may be really out of left field, but I, I put it on the list. September 11th. Always a striking date. Astronomers announced the detection of water 
in the atmosphere of exoplanet K218b, uh, the first such discovery for an exoplanet in the habitable zone around a star. Um, so, I don't know, throw, throw that one into the mix. And then in October, very important, the Amazonian Synod is held in the Vatican. Now this is, this is just corrupt from beginning to end. It was put on and paid for and sponsored by the Germans so they could get what they wanted out of it. And so they used the Amazonians from Brazil uh, to come meet at the Vatican to have a synod and celebration and try to get some um, liberal revision and these type of things pushed through. Now, what made secular headlines was the call for the consideration of the ordination of married men to the priesthood. Nothing too much really became of that. It was brought up in the final statement. It was... Um, just left out, I think. But what consumed the religious press was the attempts at idolatrous enculturation of pagan symbols and artifacts. So several Pacamama statutes, uh, statues were brought into the Synod, and there was an opening religious uh, tree planting ceremony. Uh, the statues were placed in a church and honored with religious ritual and a native ritual of a bowl of soil and flowers were brought to the altar at the offertory of the closing synod mass. Now, what are these Pachamamas? Um, some claim that these statues were supposed to represent the pregnant Elizabeth and Mary, or that they were some type of enculturated Our Lady of the Amazon. However, the Pope himself confirmed that they were the pagan Pachamama statues. Now, what is Pachamama? That's basically Mother Earth. That's the Brazilian native um, pagan deity of Mother Earth. Now, there was a, a brave and faithful Austrian Catholic activist, Alexander Schugel, if I'm saying that right. He removed the statues from their display in the church of Santa Maria, Santa Maria in Traspatina and threw them in the Tiber like all the other junk over the years that has been gotten rid of. Sadly, they were later recovered, and Pope Francis apologized. Not for the idolatry, but for any offense given when they were removed from the church and thrown into the Tiber. With all due respect, Holy Father, you should have thrown them into the Tiber. October 27th, President Trump announces that the leaders of the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, was killed um, in a special forces operation. It was reported that al-Baghdadi detonated a suicide vest after being chased into a tunnel. And of course, we don't need to review all the outrageous and horrific acts uh, that took place under his leadership. November 4th, 2019, the United States formally begins a process to pull out of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So this is those of you who are into that issue, that could relate. The next day, 11,000 scientists from around the world published a study in the journal Bioscience warning, quote, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. November 13th, public impeachment hearings. Uh, begin against President Trump. And of course, this continues throughout the fall, uh, and then he's impeached uh, toward the end of the year. November 21st, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is indicted on charges of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. So that whole Israel dynamic is working itself out over there as well. In December, of course, the mysterious coronavirus, the novel coronavirus outbreak begins in Wuhan, China. And who knows what the origin of that is? Um, you know, I've heard so many things and I, I don't know what the truth is about the origin of it. Was it because of bat soup or was it because of, um, you know, tinkering with the possible bioweapon that got out and who knows? But that begins to erupt over there in December. On December 16th, Pope Francis abolishes the pontifical secrecy in sex abuse cases. So this is a, 
a needed and a good reform that takes place. The move follows the Vatican's meeting on the protection of minors in the church uh, a few months before. The Pope also raises the definition of child pornography from 14 to 18 years old. So basically, we have some reforms that uh, try to follow up and fill some of the gaps that were, um, remain, were held over from, from previous um, um, safety protocols. December 30th, Chinese authorities announced that he, Jaiku, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, who claimed to have created the world's first genetically edited human babies, had been sentenced to three years in prison and fined uh, 430000 American dollars for his genetic research efforts. So there we have someone being held to account, and who knows if it's legit or corrupt or what, but someone who allegedly is tinkering around with uh, human children, um, and he's brought to justice. And then last but not least, December 31st, China informs the World Health Organization, which is in its back pocket, of an outbreak of a novel, novel coronavirus in Wuhan, the ninth most populous Chinese city. Well, let's talk about the pandemic as an epiphany. Now, this is an interesting take. We've been talking mostly about the pandemic as judgment, as punishment. But let's take a little bit of a different look at this. What about the pandemic or pestilence as an epiphany? If you think about the events of the Bible where you have pestilences, so, such as the plagues upon Egypt at the Exodus, um, those were meant to open eyes, to teach a lesson. So not just the lesson of, I'm punishing you, but the lesson of the God of the Hebrews is stronger than the gods of Egypt. That the gods of Egypt don't deserve to be worshipped. In fact, they don't even exist at all. It's the God of the Hebrews that deserves worship. And so we should give him that worship and so on. So pestilence can be not just an instrument of judgment, but also an instrument of revelation. So what is this experience of pestilence and pandemic what does it show to us? What does it teach us? Well, consider first the past. What have we possibly learned from these things in the past? Well, think of 100 years ago with the 1918 flu pandemic. It might have perhaps taught us about the futility of war because as many died from disease as from the war to end all wars, which of course accomplished nothing anyway. Did we learn our lesson? No. Of course not. Uh, we didn't learn from that experience, jumping into a second world war only 20 years later. But then that's, that's the human story, isn't it? Always making the same mistakes again and again. Well, what has this pandemic revealed to us? What have we co suddenly come to realize? What have we opened our eyes finally and noticed for the first time? Well, one of the things I notice is that we have a great fear of death, at least our own death, not so much other people's death. But consider all this, masks, distance, shutdowns, shutting down the global economy, selfish perspectives, losing perspective. We talked about this at the very beginning. This plague is not like the Middle Ages with the Black Death where half of the population died. According to the CDC, if you're under 49 years old, I'm 45, your rate of COVID recovery is 99.92%. Now, some will die who are under that age, of course. But how does that stand out against any threat, any threat? threat at all. 99.92% of recovery. Um, and then even a little bit older. The CDC says if you're in your 70s, your rate of COVID recovery is still extremely high. 94.6%. 
Basically, those who are most at risk are in their 90s. So it's very good at pushing people over the edge, people who are bare, barely alive, barely on the fringes of life. They are easy pickings for this disease. The rest of us, not so much. Um, in fact, the CDC says as many as 40% uh, have the virus and don't even realize they have it at all. And yet we have devastated everyone. We have ruined our quality of life over this in many ways simply because of our fear of death. So uh, currently we have a spike in infections and in hospitalizations and that's causing some places to shut down again. A, a lot in Europe, a lot of places all around uh, the United States here, but we see that the rise in death is very mild. In fact, the percentage, I suppose, keeps going down and down because of the, uh, the spike in infections. Um, we still don't have that matching rise in deaths. And interestingly, we continue to hover just above the epidemic threshold. There was a time in May when it was going down and down and down, and it looked like we might fall below that threshold of, that would qualify as an official epidemic. But it always never quite got there. It eased back up. And so we are still just kind of right above the edge of what would be considered technically an epidemic. So this pandemic epidemic is still just kind of barely existing in terms of how we categorize it. So we have a fear of death. Another thing I notice is that um, we are not as strong or united as a people, as a culture, as we might have thought. We will easily turn against one another, be suspicious of one another. It makes you think of a Twilight Zone episode, that one where the lights go out and all the neighbors are kind of turning on each other. And yet the little things, the little things of social distancing and business closures and school closures have taken a tremendous toll on our emotional and mental well-being, and we've seen depression, um, abuse of drugs and alcohol, domestic violence, divorce, and suicide have all skyrocketed. And so are, can we be resilient? We're going to find that out too, uh, and time will tell. Um, in terms of economic resilience, we've seen that sharp V, as they call it, um, but still that's that just happened. I mean, that 33% growth in the economy, unheard of. Um, how will that play out? Will that continue to be a full recovery? Is that just a, a minor jumpstart part of the way? Or we shall see uh, how resilient we are as a nation, as a culture, as an economy, as individuals within ourselves. We will learn a lot about ourselves through this, this pandemic. Another thing, a huge epiphany, perhaps the biggest one, is that we don't just have a medical pandemic, we have a cultural pandemic. And I'm indebted to uh, Dr. Tony Evans of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, just down the road from me. He's the founder and pastor there. And he had a great sermon um, and a YouTube video and an article um, back in the early days of the pandemic um, and in the early days after uh, George Floyd. And, and this is part of what he had to say here. He says, we're in a medical pandemic right now. Simultaneously, we're in a cultural pandemic because we've seen the devolution of our society. And we're in a cultural pandemic because we're in a spiritual pandemic. And then a little bit further down, he says, the biggest problem in the culture is the church because the church has failed. We wouldn't even have a racial crisis in America if the church had not failed to deal with this sin like God calls it in his word. But because they've passed it off, ignored it, or even promoted it, we still have this division in our culture. So don't expect a God, God to fix the White House if he can't even change the church house. And so we have this problem of racism. And how much problem do we have with racism? It's hard to tell. I mean, this is something we thought we were all past. That was something back in the 60s, in a bygone era. 
We had a black president, for crying out loud. And yet, all of a sudden, we seem as divided as ever. Also, we have a Marxist insurrection in the United States. Who ever thought we would see that? That was something you thought was a, from a bygone era of uh, anti-American activities and the um, Soviet infiltration of, of American society and fomenting revolutions and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the Cold War is over. Uh, it's not even the Soviet Union anymore. It collapsed. Um, and yet, here it is, all over the place. And I'm very much intrigued by one thing that I noticed. I can't breathe. That phrase is the connection between COVID, a respiratory disease which takes away your ability to breathe. I can't breathe. The connection between COVID and the cultural pandemic. Those were the dying words of George Floyd, whose death sparked months of protests and rioting. And then also, of course, we have an ongoing theme and realization again and again of corruption. Corruption going to the highest level. Um, corruption in the church. And, you know, I used to think, um, oh, the corruption of the church, that was something back in the Middle Ages. And, uh, you know, it's not like that anymore. And now we have saints leading the church all over the place, except for a few, you know, Jim Baker and a few high-profile scandals and such. I have become convinced more and more that this is the most corrupt era of the church ever in history. And, uh, I mean, you think back to, uh, like, the... Uh, now this is kind of a PG-13 sort of reference, so you may want to tune out if you have uh, children with you. But the Feast of Chestnuts and during the uh, pontificate of uh, Pope Alexander VI, the Borgia Pope, um, was basically a big orgy in the Vatican, a um, big party. And they, you know, they were given over to licentiousness and just indulgence of carnal delights. Well, you had the same type of thing uh, just a year or two ago in uh, the apartment of the CDF. You had a cocaine-fueled um, gay orgy. And notice it was in the apartment of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, the Inquisition the people who were responsible for enforcing doctrine. And the big difference, what pushes modern day over the top, is back then you didn't have so much corruption about doctrine. Nobody cared about doctrine. You know, they just wanted to be immoral. But now it's all about doctrine as well. Doctrine and immorality. And they are intimately connected together by the thread of corruption. Of course, you have corruption all over the place in government. Um, you know, I find it intriguing in the political scene uh, where the Republicans um, kept nominating nice guys and kept getting beaten. And I think it was Rush Limbaugh who put it, um, characterized it uh, that way and said, uh, well, then the Republicans chose a brawler, a Brooklyn brawler or bra from Queens or wherever, a fighter uh, who, you know, if he's not in a fight, then he's picking a fight. And uh, his big thing was drain the swamp. And so they went out and got a sleazy casino man <laughs> to come and battle corruption. And, uh, of course, you know, the swamp creatures don't like that. So uh, again and again, you see revelations of corruption. He ran against perhaps one of the most corrupt candidates in Clinton and then um, one of the most corrupt candidates in Joe Biden. So there's no end to the whole story of corruption. It goes on and on. But what lessons can we learn? What difference can we make? Well, let's conclude this segment with a prayer from the Collect for the Mass in Time of Plague and Pestilence. Let us pray. O God, who wouldest not the death of a sinner, but rather that he should repent, look down in mercy on thy people who turn again to thee that they, being ever steadfast in thy service, may by thy mercy be delivered from the scourges of thy wrath. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, now let's turn to the question of God's judgment upon the world. Now, if you recall from a previous study, we had gone over those four sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance, those sins about which that particular metaphor is used. And of course, homosexuality is one of those in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God uh, came down and he says, I'm going to investigate and hear if this outrage and cry is really as I'm hearing it. And of course, they were destroyed uh, by fire from heaven. Well, attitudes about that, of course, in recent time, times, recent years, have been uh, changing very fast. Um, and they've been, been changing on the ground really before uh, our full realization of it. Uh, for example, when California's Proposition 8, uh, where marriage is defined as one man and one woman in the state constitution, when that was struck down by the U.S. District Court in 2010, so 10 years ago, I commented this on my blog. I said, quote, I'd like to remind everyone that the church has always supported the rights of gays and lesbians to marry. And as long as there are no impediments, we also support the rights of Christian gays and lesbians to have their marriages solemnized in the church, end quote. Now, when people saw that, they were taken aback. That was part of my strategy. One person commented, is this April 1st? And that's the point. It was to illustrate how far the meaning of marriage had already been altered in the public mind by the political discourse. People no longer thought of marriage as being only one man and one woman. Well, fast forward a couple of years, Obergefell versus Hodges was the ruling that legalized gay marriage, or better put, redefined marriage for all 50 states. That was handed down in 2015. A woman named Kim Davis of Rowan County, Kentucky, was the only county clerk in the United States to refuse to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. There are 300, sorry, 3,143 counties or their equivalent, and one clerk out of 3,143 refused to do it. She refused for reasons of conscience, both moral and religious, not necessarily even standing the way saying that can't happen, but just asking that such licenses not be issued with her name on the certificate. And she served jail time as a result. Now you think 2015, well, is that kind of too long ago to really be a part of the piece of the puzzle here? Well, in 2018, Kim Davis switched from Democrat to Republican, ran for re-election, and lost. And she left office in January 2019. Now I want to take a moment. I don't know if she'll ever see this. Who knows? But I want to talk to Kim Davis. And I want to apologize. You know, when, when you did what you did, I remember my colleagues all across the country not having your back, throwing you under the bus. And I was just the same. I think, I don't remember anything specific, but I think when people might have asked me about, about it, I probably said something about, uh, she's kind of a hypocrite, you know. I, I hear she's on her fourth marriage or something. Shame on me. I think that event was a true, a true epiphany judgment on America that we are no longer a Christian nation. If we were, there would have been 3,143 county clerks refusing to solemnize these weddings. Well, was she applauded by Christian leaders? No. In America, no. Around the globe, no. Even the Pope threw her under the bus. 
Within a few weeks of Davis's release from jail, she and her husband met with Pope Francis on September 24, 2015, in Washington, D.C. Two days later, the Holy See press office issued a statement saying that, quote, the Pope did not enter into the details of the situation of Ms. Davis and his meeting with her should not be considered a form of support of her position in all of its particular and complex aspects, end quote. So according to the Vatican spokesman, the Pope met with several dozen other people as well. You know, no big deal. And rosaries were also given to others in attendance. He pointed out that Davis was not invited by the Pope to the nunciature, but by the nuncio at the time, a man by the name of Archbishop Carlo Marie Vigano. And quote, the meeting may have been manipulated by her and her lawyer, end quote. And it went out to point out that the only audience, which is a more formal one-on-one -on -one type of meeting, uh, the only audience given by the Pope while in Washington on his visit was with a former student of his, an openly gay Argentinian named Yahoo Grassi and Grassi's same-sex partner of 19 years. Well, now let's talk about Marxism in the world. And we know that heaven takes an interest in geopolitics. It's concerned with individual souls and with personal lives, but God is also concerned with the big picture. It's, uh, I mean, you look down from heaven, you see the whole world. It makes sense. From Fatima, we know that heaven does not like communism and Marxism. In her apparition of July 13, 1917, Our Lady of Fatima told Sister Lucy that, quote, Russia will spread its errors throughout the world, raising up wars and persecutions against the church. The church will be, or sorry, the good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. Well, it's a brief statement. What are we to make it of it all? What do the errors, what are the errors of Russia? Well, certainly what they're known for is communism. But how do we unpack that? Well, in her article, Have the Errors of Russia Now Infected Rome? Dr. Makey, not sure how to say that name, Makey Hickson gives uh, a pretty good list. So she had a, a blog post saying, what then are the errors of Russia as they were developing at the time of the Bolshevik Russian Revolution, shortly after these Fatima apparitions. It would seem that they include, among other things, the following list of characteristics. A reductively atheistic materialist worldview, which aims at undermining anything Christian in society. Check. An ideology, sorry, ideology that is disconnected from truth and reality. Check. A cultural Marxism that later permeated also the West with the help of the Frankfurt School and Antonio Gramsci's ideas. Check. And basically that's infiltrating the, the structures that are already there rather than, you know, coming in with an army and blowing, every, blowing everybody away. Uh, a revolutionary socialist spirit that undermines especially major aspects of family life, especially with the help of feminism, divorce, and abortion. Check. A Hegelian dialectic philosophy, along with dialectic materialism, which aims which, sorry, which claims that strife and ongoing contention in society are necessary in order to bring about higher and unfolding forms of life. Such an approach essentially denies and purportedly transcends the principle of law or non-contradiction. Yes. A form of governing revolutionary socialism that also constitutionally is called democratic centralism the latter formulation, meaning that the things that have the appearance of being openly democratic, yet they are all centrally organized and managed in the background. 
and Dr. Robert Hickson recently applied this principle to the current situation in the church, especially with regard to the family synods. And I'll tell you, this whole synod on the family thing was a huge mess, and I can definitely see her point on that one. A disregard for tradition and for the traditional institutions of society, or now of the church, and making those into counter-revolutionary forces, basically compromising them. A deceitful misuse of language with the intent to manipulate the public. Yes. A method of branding one's own opponents with sweeping and demeaning epithets that abstractly categorize them as right-wing or counter-revolutionary. And what about, of course, always throwing around the word fascist? Check. An approach to ongoing revolutionary changes where there is both a slow path and a fast path of the revolution. Such is the dialectic and the dialectical process, yes. Toward more moderate and compromising opponents, one first tries to incorporate them into the professed new system so as to use them as Lenin's useful idiots in the sense that they help give us to the world the illusory idea that nothing has really changed. I think that's a good insight. As a last element, she says, but of course, very important and painful for one who lived under communism, there is a constant sense of distrust and fear unto the imprisonment and killing of one's intransient opponents. Well, we haven't, at least in this area, gotten around to that sort of thing. But there's definitely um, a lot of distrust, a lot of fear, a lot of loss of confidence in public institutions, and a lot of lack of concern for people being doxxed, mistreated, um, cancel cultured, and so on. Um, canceled, let's just say that. Which leads me to talk about corruption in the media. Of course, Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. And Pilate, remember, said, what is truth? Well, we have a crisis of truth, of re reliability, and trust of media. We've seen the decline of journalism as a profession, um, the rise of problems like deep fakes, those videos that where you can basically put somebody else's face uh, on you and uh, even somebody else's voice, even have an entirely computer generated person. And it's getting to be so real and almost impossible to analyze and figure out uh, what's real and what's not. Um, and there's a wonderful documentary from um, Cernovich. I forgot his first name now. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll put the link down below the trailer and the full film. It's, it's on YouTube for rent. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, I was blown away and I keep thinking about it more and more. It kind of keeps, it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> And it's called hoaxed. And it's not so much about like a hoax, you know, as it is just kind of fake news and, and the decline of journalism. Um, and really, he sums it all up in one sentence that's in the trailer and in the movie where he says, all media is narrative and we are in a war of narratives. And Cernovich, and he's kind of a nut anyway, but he's really right with this. There's not journalism anymore as it was. It's all yellow. It's all gone propagandist. It's all narrative. And it's all about a battle of narratives. And it's a shame. And then that leads me to think back to at St. Gabriel's conference in January. Um, our topic for Theology on Tap was, do we have a problem with delusion? And that was a question that was provoked, provoked my own interest over Heather MacDonald's book, The Diversity Delusion. Now, she's an atheist, uh, so she may be deluded, too, about that, certainly. Um, but the book is very insightful and timely. It's talking about the gender and racial myths, uh, some people would say lies, that have gripped college campuses all over the United States. Uh, I'm going to put a link to um, a description of the book 
And so take a look at that and see what you think uh, yourself. And then, of course, we talked about Black Lives Matter, founded a, a bit back in 2013 by three black women to protest police violence, especially against blacks, and was fueled by several high-profile police shooting incidents, such as the Michael Brown case, and um, especially fueled by the clearing of the officer, uh, Darren Wilson. Uh, now, looking at the big picture, even though crime has been on a steady decline since the 1970s, and a drastic decline, I mean, if you look at the high point back in the 70s and the low point, uh, you know, just last year, uh, it's, what a blessing from heaven. And active policing has such, made such great strides in improving public safety. And studies repeatedly show that there was no racial disparity in policing. Well, the BLM use these outlier, high-profile, horrible events, creating a climate of fear and distrust and the illusion of a kind of epidemic of racially motivated police violence. And the major policy push is, that we've seen is to defund or even abolish the police in various localities. Oh, but also in the BLM About Us document, the goals of the movement are also about other things that uh, they're interested in, promoting an LBGTQ agenda and undermining the nuclear family, so apparently black fathers don't matter to BLM. And they're quite open about being not just cultural Marxists, but the old-fashioned traditional kind of economic Marxists as well. Well, where do we stand now? Of course, we've seen the explosion of violent crime across the nation this past summer and fall. Uh, but even in this situation, Heather McDonald reports that, quote, an elderly resident in the Mount Hope neighborhood of the Bronx once described to me her fear of entering her building lobby, since it was so often occupied by trespassing youth hanging out and selling drugs. The only time she felt safe was when law enforcement was around. As long as she saw the police, she told me, everything is okay. You can come down and get your mail and talk to decent people. Improve, don't abolish police. This sentiment is echoed in the dozens of police community meetings I've attended. Though they also want improved quality of policing, the percentage of black respondents in a 2015 Gallup poll who wanted more police in their community was more than twice as high as the percentage of white respondents who said the same. Activists who seek to, dis to disband police departments will have to explain to these law-abiding residents that they will, in essence, just have to fend for themselves. Such self-defense may be understandable if the police were engaging in an epidemic of shooting unarmed black men and women, as we now hear daily. But there is no such epidemic. For the last five years, the police have fatally shot about a thousand civilians annually, the vast majority of whom were armed or otherwise dangerous. Black people account for about 23% of those shot and killed by police. They are about 13% of the U.S. population. As of the June 22nd update, the Washington Post's database of fatal police shootings showed 14 unarmed black victims and 25 unarmed white victims in 2019. The database does not include those killed by other means, like George Floyd. The number of unarmed black shooting victims is down 63 percent from 2015 when the database began. There are about 7,300 black homicide victims a year. The 14 unarmed victims in fatal police shootings would compromise only 0.2 percent of that total. Ideally, she says, officers would never take anyone's life in the course of their duties. But given the number of arrests they make each year, around 10 million, and the number of deadly weapon attacks on officers, an average of 27 per day in just two-thirds 
of the nation's police departments, according to a 2014 analysis. It is not clear that the 1,000 civilian shooting deaths suggests that law enforcement is out of control. And I put a link to that, and I encourage you to look down below and read more. So this cultural pandemic has also highlighted, highlighted the problem of cultural Marxism and of critical race theory. Pause me, I need to wet my whistle here. Well, as I pointed out in my sermon on Trinity Sunday uh, this year, I said, yes, it does matter what you believe. And going back here, I said, as the Baptist preacher Tony Evans put it, we have a cultural pandemic going on. Just as in the medical pandemic, we need accurate information to fix problems. Wrong diagnosis could mean the cure does more harm than good even though we've all been indoctrinated with cultural Marxism. Most people have not thought about the impact of these ideas. Marxist economic theory divides humanity into classes of people and sees the unfolding of history, borrowing the Hegelian dialectic, as an ongoing class struggle with the revolt of the workers. In Russia and China, in North Korea and Cuba and Venezuela, they will tell you the same thing. Yes, it matters what you believe. Marx said the rich and the poor will always have at it, so fight the rich. Jesus said you will always have rich and poor. Put me first. Store up your treasures in heaven where we can be together. That means rich, look out for the poor. That's your fellow man. Yes, it matters what you believe. Cultural Marxism divides humanity into groups based on sex or race, pitting those groups as antagonists in a great struggle that is ingrained in the structures and functions of our society. And that's where we got our first political correctness back in the late 80s and early 90s. In the academy and law schools, it developed into critical race theory, and there are several kinds of critical theory. Now, critical race theory has become the dominant paradigm for public policy. According to the UCLA School of Public Affairs, quote, CRT, or critical race theory, recognizes that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of the American society. The individual racist need not exist to note that institutional racism is, is pervasive in the dominant culture. This is the analytic, analytical lens that CRT uses in examining existing power structures. CRT identifies that these power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. So that's from UCLA School of Public Affairs. Now, did you notice that one poisonous point right in the middle of the quote? The individual racist need not exist for the cultural institutions to be racist. Now assume that we have a big problem with racist cops, for example. It's easy to assume race as a motivation when something goes wrong. That is, evidence does not matter. We are addicted to outrage and can manufacture our own at will. And so it does not matter if Derek Chauvin, who is accused of murdering George Floyd, it doesn't matter if he's a racist. The system is racist. So it's the system that needs to come down. We've already had calls for the dismantling of police departments. The L.A. mayor cut $150 million out of the police budget. Now, the rich can always hire their own security. What about the poor? Yes, it matters what you believe. When you believe the problem is one thing, while actually another, those problems go on and persist and fuel more turmoil. When you have police departments that suffer from being mismanaged or corrupt or undermanned and having to lower standards to recruit and retain, and you address the problem with diversity seminars and cutbacks, the community suffers and the problem gets worse. 
And when you lose sight of the doctrine of creation, in which we are all children of our first parents, made in God's own image, who can hear our brother's blood crying out from the ground, it becomes harder to recognize our common humanity and to empathize with our fellow human beings. And we're left protesting, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, it matters what you believe. All the problems, all the evils we have to face are within the human heart. The evils of racism, presumption, lack of empathy, greed, lust for power. These are not so much problems out there as they are in the human heart. That fleshliness will overcome us until we turn to God in repentance. Turn to God who has the power to heal, to forgive, to restore. Sometimes you can get by okay with a lack of information. But when you base important decisions on bad information or false belief, it can be absolutely devastating. Yes, a broken clock is right twice a day. But a working clock set to the wrong time is never right. People are searching for answers, and we have the light of divine revelation. People are putting their trust in all kinds of things that can't help them. We have the accurate information to diagnose the problem of sin, and we have the medicine of forgiveness through repentance and grace. People need this information. They need divine life that we can share. They need to know the problems, to know right from wrong. There's too much confusion out there, and sometimes we let them down. As the Lord said in Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The leaders of the church have failed us in standing up to the, to the literal nonsense of cultural Marxism and critical race theory. Mostly they've just fallen in line with secular authorities. Case in point, Father Daniel Maloney was chaplain, was chaplain to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology until he pointed out quite correctly that we still don't know to what extent the killing of George Floyd was racist. We're still waiting for that evidence to be presented, for some argument to be made. At which point his boss, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, Archbishop of Boston, threw him under the bus. You can read, read more about that below. Let's offer a prayer, again from the Mass in Time of Pestilence, this time the secret at the offertory. Let us pray. We beseech thee, O Lord, that the sacrifice which we offer may be our succor, that by the power thereof we may be loosed from every error and delivered from all the assaults of destruction through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we've talked about being a judgment for the world, but now let's consider judgment upon the church with this pandemic. If it is a chastisement, then that means it's a response to the church or Christian nations rather than to the pagan or secular world. In fact, that makes sense that we should look to that area for answers. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. For, for, and if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And so Peter says, We are accountable, more accountable than the world. Judgment doesn't begin with the emperor in Rome. It begins with the church. And we like Aaron the priest that we read about last time, should be jumping in between the people and, and God's wrath, offering incense like Aaron did as a pleasing sacrifice, employing God's mercy. We should jump into the gap, repenting of our own shortcomings. Really, our big shortcoming is just not being the church. We should pray for our society and ask for the scourges of divine wrath to be lifted. 
We've seen mass demonstrations of people taking to the streets, protesting police brutality. Does that even exist? Moral protest by all of these people. Is the church doing that kind of thing? Are we taking to the streets in moral protest in support of moral causes? Are we out there protesting against abortion? Well, we do have the March for Life once a year, but that's once a year. Think about all the protests we've seen night after night after night after night. Have we flooded the streets about marriage? Have we flooded the streets about proper wages and, and respect of our neighbor? And we haven't flooded the streets about anything. Instead, during this time, we've turned away from the church. We've shut down. Churches have closed. In fact, there's it's kind of speculation at this point, but it's estimated that maybe as many as half of the churches across the country ultimately won't make it, won't reopen their doors. I would think probably around 20% at least will be sort of tipped over off the edge during this crisis of the pandemic. And then, of course, we talked about earlier, we had that summer of shame with McCarrick and China. And note, in the spread of the virus, the virus first traveled from China to Italy. Is there something to that? Is there a clue there? Is there a lesson to be learned? Read more about um, papal corruption. I have some Damien Thompson for The Spectator in uh, London does an excellent, excellent job of commentary on the church, and he has a wonderful podcast, and so I'm putting links down to that with the, with the description of each podcast um, on papal corruption, a couple of them on the church and China, um, and also of um, corruption in the Vatican and so on. Uh, it's very Nixonian over there. Uh, this, this particular pope is so corrupt in terms of his dealings, his manipulation. He's very much a Peronist. He, he brings around people, he promotes people, he surrounds himself with people who are morally compromised. Uh, he uses people. He's, um, he's gone into heresy and, and trying to change doctrines of the church, uh, saying that there is no hell, that that's not consistent with the gospel, uh, saying that the death penalty is not consistent with the gospel and so on. Uh, I'll put in a, a link to uh, the, the problems doctrinally related with Pope Francis down there as well. Then we've talked about false worship in the Vatican, even in Rome with the Pacamama, uh, idols being brought into the temple of God. And then one thing I would recommend, if you only click on one of these podcasts and listen to them, let it be this one, Suicide by Secularization, How the Churches Are Dying. Damian Thompson does an excellent job, and it is just devastating to hear his description. And the, the description of the podcast, that particular episode, goes like this. This episode of Holy Smoke, that's the name of the podcast, by the way, Holy Smoke, exposes the extent to which ordinary Christians have been betrayed by their own bishops. This is a process that began decades ago, but it is only this year during the coronavirus epidemic, that we've seen just how corrupted church leaders have become by secularization. And I think he hits it right on the head. And so I encourage you to take a listen to that. There's a lot to think about in terms of God's judgment upon the church. We've covered most of these details before now, but we kind of want to refresh them in our mind and consider there's a lot that God may be addressing in the church during this time of pestilence. And so let us close this segment with the post-communion collect from that mass in time of pestilence. Let us pray. Hear us, O God of our salvation, that we, thy people, being delivered from the terrors of thy wrath, may by the bountiful goodness of thy mercy abide in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's time 
to get right with God. If there's any message during this pandemic, it can all really just boil down to that one line. It's time to get right with God. It's always the time to get right with God. As Paul says, today is the day of salvation. And that was true yesterday, and that will be true tomorrow. Whatever day it is, this day is the day of our salvation. And so regardless of whether God is sending us a message through this pandemic, or even if there is no message, there is always a message to be had, a message consistent throughout the Bible and throughout church history. Repent from your evil ways, return to the Lord, and be saved. Put His will before your own. Do right. Do penance. Joshua 1, 9 offers a verse of encouragement. Be strong, be courageous, and the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. That was spoken to Joshua as he was bearing the mantle of leadership for God's people. And I think Psalm 46 offers a wonderful consolation during this time of struggle. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. My prayer is that God would be very present to you in your life, in your troubles, in your struggles, in your desires and yearnings to turn to Him and to do His will. God bless you. Well, thank you for joining us for this series on the Bible and the pandemic. Comment down below and let me know what you think. Um, I'm curious about what all of your reactions are and, and what your thoughts are and how you may be putting pieces of the puzzle together and what insights you may find. Please share this series so others may learn more about this topic. And join us next time. Next week, we'll be back with a new series for Advent on the Blessed Virgin Mary. So come back again and join us for Sunday School. And if you're in Dallas, I invite you to come join us for worship in person. You can look us up and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Oh,